All right, good afternoon. Those of you online, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Annie Montz and I'm the project manager for the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. We are excited to be back in person. Those of you that are in the room, um, if you did not sign in, there's sign-in sheets up at the table. Um, as we continue to see pandemic and conditions improve, we really hope to continue to see more of you back in person soon. Obviously, we've all become masters of Zoom and there's never any technology issues, um, but in case there are, thank you for your patience as we work through them. Uh, we are not used to doing the hybrid lecture, uh, but we have great tech support here today. This webinar is being recorded and will be on our website um, in the next week, and it will be eligible for credit within the, within the next 30 days as well. So feel free to send it on to your friends um, and colleagues. You will receive a link to the evaluation tomorrow in the email address that you registered for. Those of you in person, you will probably receive an email saying you did not attend. I will make sure that you get the link to the evaluation. Please complete the evaluation as this not only helps us track attendance, but gives us great comments for future, um, for future lectures as well. Those virtually the Q&A box is open as always. I will be working with Dr. Meager at the end um, to be able to provide those questions to her at the end of the lecture when she's ready. Dr. Meager has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, so I'm excited to introduce Dr. Ashley Meager. She is a trauma and acute care surgeon at IU Health Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis and is affiliated with the Indiana University School of Medicine. She's board certified in general surgery and surgical critical care. She is also the director of research for the acute care surgery division. Dr. Meager obtained her medical degree from the University of Utah and her MPH from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She completed her surgical training at Loyola in Chicago and Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. Dr. Meager is passionate about, passionate about disparities in care as it pertains to injured patients. She has subsequently extended her work to education about implicit bias and achieving inclusivity in medicine. She performs numerous training sessions on these topics throughout the IU School of Medicine and IU Health organizations throughout the year. And she hopes to provoke critical conversations about the biases in the healthcare system and use these conversations to spark change. Dr. Meager. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, thank you, Annie. Um, so, I just want to say I had a really hard time this morning because I had to, I figured out I actually had to wear pants and not soft pants for the lecture. So welcome back in person. Um, and hopefully we can kind of navigate the hybrid world that we now live in. Um, today we're going to be talking about recognizing bias. And this is a conversation about clinical impact. I really do want this to be a conversation. I'm okay if we don't get through all the slides. Um, if you have questions, or you wanna have a discussion about something, please feel free to raise your hand or put a comment in and Annie's monitoring um, because we do a lot of training sessions where we talk about these things, but I think that taking the next step to how we incorporate it into our daily lives is still that kind of really difficult area. So I have no financial interests. I have many biases. I will cite examples of them and how they affect me daily. Topics in this talk may make you uncomfortable. This talk is not intended to be an in-depth training session in implicit bias or upstander interventions. And I mostly hope to provoke your awareness and stimulate conversation. So as, as Annie said, my name's Ashley Meager. My pronouns are she, her. I am a cisgender female surgeon who is Hispanic. So I have many underrepresented minority um, characteristics, but I also recognize that I have a lot of privilege. I appear white, I don't have an accent. I have a white person name um, and I, frankly, grew up in an economically advantaged situation. And so being in both realms and both spheres, I understand how, um, one, bias is difficult to talk about. Um, two, how bias affects us all the time. Um, I 
have been told I don't look old enough to be a doctor. I have been told, I've been asked, where are you from? And I say, Colorado. And then they say, where are you really from? What does that do to us on a daily basis? What does it do when you hear someone make a comment about that kind of patient, that kind of person? Um, it really changes the dynamics of your interpersonal communication. It changes the dynamics of how a team works together and it changes the dynamics of how we care for patients and how patients respond to us. Just for a, putting a little bit, um, everybody on kind of the same platform, the dis discrimination as defined by the IU um, health policies is perceptions, attitudes, or prejudices toward another individual due to perceived affiliation in a particular group, resulting in differential or unfair treatment or mistreatment. Microaggressions are brief and commonplace verbal or nonverbal exchanges. They can be intentional or unintentional. And it's important to know that they communicate aggression, hostility, or bigotry towards primarily marginalized groups. These can be offhanded slights, put downs, um, and even offensive belittling. Microaggressions are comments that can happen, or do happen on a daily basis. And I think one of the really interesting thing about microaggressions is that the unintentional microaggressions almost cut a little bit deeper. Someone may say, where are you from? And they're thinking, I'm just trying to be friendly. Oh, you don't look old enough to be a doctor. Well, I'm just trying to compliment you on how young you look. But the problem is when you hear that day after day after day, it is, it wears on you. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Different comments like all lives matter are a little bit more uh, intended to belittle or disrespect. Um, and those microaggressions um, are a little bit different. And what is implicit bias? So I'm gonna bring all of these terms together because I think that's one of the issues in this kind of area of uh, uh, equity um, discussions is that we have so many words that are used and they're sort of used interchangeably. But implicit bias is a tendency or inclination that results in judgment without question. Implicit bias is an automatic response that our brains have developed to develop a shortcut as a shortcut to interact with the world, all right? So you see a car hit their red lights in front of you, your foot automatically goes to the brake. So it's a danger detector and your implicit biases are not intentional. They're things that you have learned throughout your lived experience. I got over a quarantine. I have a quarantine puppy, just like many people do. Um, he is a big, black German shepherd dog. I never realized that people had implicit biases against dogs, uh, but they do. People literally cross the street away from me when my, me and my 80 pound black German shepherd dog are walking down the street. And it struck me because if it makes me feel bad, imagine how it makes a person feel when, they're, when you cross the street from a person. Implicit biases are not inherently bad, but when they are used in emotional decisions or decisions that really pertain to um, someone's career, someone's health, someone's life, then that is when it can become bad. When we make an assumption about someone seeking opioids in the emergency room, when we make an assumption about that kind of patient, that kind of person, Everybody has implicit biases. Spend some time and think about your experience and what your implicit biases are. 
I'm happy if anyone wants to talk, we can talk, I can talk all day about different implicit biases. I have biases about tortillas, ice cream, TV shows, dog, dog breeds, right? I also have biases about gendered names, certain injury patterns in patients, certain behaviors in patients, right? And so you have to recognize like the ice cream bias, okay, but the patient bias, maybe need to take a step back, take a pause and assess how that is affecting your decision-making. And kind of to bring all this together, the, I love the iceberg analogy. Um, so explicit discrimination is really kind of outside the water. That is hate speech, violence, physical or verbal abuse, neglect. The microaggressions hang right at the surface here. Micro assaults. Oh, are there any white doctors around here? Okay, that's a micro assault. Micro insults. Oh, your English is so good. Or micro invalidations. You don't look young enough. You don't look old enough to be a doctor. They're not necessarily explicit in their harm, but they still cause it. And then implicit discrimination or implicit bias lurks underneath. And it's a lot of the kind of things we do. We assume homogeneity. We assume a person's inherent qualities. We deny the fact that we don't have personal bias. I've literally had a person say, I don't have time to be racist. Assuming normality or superiority and ascribing intelligence of any sort based on assumptions. We know that implicit bias affects everybody, um, particularly women and underrepresented minorities. In academic medicine, letters of recommendation favor men. Um, there is also a lot of worded, um, different wording around people of color. Interviews, hiring, and promotion favor white men. Disparities in journal editorial boards, peer reviewers, medical society awards, and leadership have all been documented. It was just within the last five years that we reached double digits, the number of female chairs of surgery in this country. And there's still not double digits of female chairs of departments of orthopedic surgery. And I think there's only three, the last time I checked, female neurosurgical chairs of departments. Healthcare delivery. Women physicians frequently uh, experience implicit bias. Um, hearing comments about age and weight. And it, it's known that the biases lead to more undesirable patient interactions. There's a lot of discussion about the fact that black patients receive inequitable care. A lot of these are around biases that we have towards patients. Um, and how do we cognizantly make those changes, make that step from, I want to be a better physician, I want to, to take care of people and make that step, step to, I understand my biases and why I might be making these decisions which impact people of color, people who are different than me. And like I said, so biases affect all interactions, patients to providers, Right? Patients refuse care by a specific provider based on something that is other, right? I don't want you as my doctor, I want the male. I don't want a black doctor, I want a white doctor. Focusing on the provider otherness. Culture or language assumptions. Why can't I get a doctor that speaks English? And then there's also providers and patients invoking patient race in presentations when really it doesn't matter. Treatment um, being prescribed differently based on gender, race, culture, language. Oh, we don't offer that to them because in their culture, they, they have mistrust in the healthcare system. And so therefore we don't offer this procedure culture or language assumptions. Oh yeah, the 13 year old 
can totally translate for their father while we're in the um, in the room. It's it's much easier if the thirteen year old just translates rather than getting a, a licensed translator. All of this, particularly the microaggressions, but I think in addition the bias exp experienced every day and the the cognitive dissonance that bias causes in our healthcare system leads to healthcare worker burnout. Microaggressions play a large role in the development of burnout symptoms. These are cumulative daily incidents. They increase stress, they decrease performance. And a lot of this is because microaggressions are specific actions. I can think of the specific time that this happened. This specific person said this thing to me. They can cause physical and emotional symptoms. Stress, anxiety, depression, sleep loss. It feels like you are constantly fighting. Constantly fighting for recognition. Constantly fighting to be appreciated. And many people in the literature have described this as death by a thousand small cuts. Like in and of itself, one single comment doesn't matter. But when you're say rounding on 40 patients and 40 different patients say to you one little comment, it, it can be exhausting. So what do we do? We've got all of this negative kind of information coming in about how hard this is for, for people to experience. And it's hard to think of something a single person can do to stand up and change the structural and societal racism and bias that has been built. But you can do something. You can be an upstander. Upstanders are individuals who fill a gap when vacancies arise. They hold a we-ness perspective and they respond because of a personal responsibility to help. They do not stand by and watch injustice happen. And uh, we have at, at the FAPDD has, has developed an upstander intervention training course. Um, I'll talk about it a little more at the end, but this is the framework that um, we are teaching throughout the School of Medicine. Um, and in brief, it's you assess the situation, you interject, and then you restore the situation back to where you, where you started. And so the, in assessing, you want to assess the ability of the aggressor to be coherent in dialogue. Mostly this is like if a, if a delirious patient is saying something, but can they be cognizant and have a dialogue and a, a conversation about what they just said? Assess the targeted person's body language, their style of communication, their immediate reaction. And then the upstander should assess your, your own tone and your body language. If the targeted person is going to stand up for themselves, then the upstander is basically gonna kind of have their hand on their back. Not physically, that might be unwelcome touching, but stand there, together and support the person as they go through this. But if the targeted person really is not ready to say for the 700th time, I'm from the state of Colorado, then the upstander can insert themselves into the conflict with words and if needed actions. So actions not being physical, but maybe we just take this, maybe we remove ourselves from the situation. Maybe we kind of put ourselves in the way so that the targeted person feels less targeted. And things you can say can be very simple. It's not about trying to change their mind. It's about provoking their awareness that what they just said or did was, <clears throat> was inappropriate. So I'm not sure what you meant by that. It can be very effective. Could you explain to me what you meant by that? Because then someone has to say out loud the inappropriate thing. And then they hear themselves say it and they're like, oh, that was probably inappropriate. And then you want to restore the focus 
back to whatever situation was at hand. If it's taking care of a patient, let's return to taking the best care of you that we can. So the aggressor can see what is most important, what is unacceptable. You wanna make sure that you maintain confidence and affirm confidence in the targeted person. And then closure, going in and having feedback with the whole group that was involved minus the aggressor. So if we're in a team situation, you wanna say, I understand that was, really, that was really hard to go through. I am here for you. I understand if you don't want to take care of this patient anymore, uh, let me know what you want to do, you know, and talking with the team and getting feedback and making sure that there is understanding about that person's, that aggressor's behavior is not appropriate and not tolerated. The upstanders' goals are to support the oppressed. Do not take over. So if they're saying something and they're standing up and they're going to bat for themselves, then you just kind of stand there with your hand on their back and say, I got you, I support you, I am here for you. Um, that was really hard, do you wanna talk about it later? But don't take over, don't make it about yourself, the upstander. Don't focus on changing minds. When these events are occurring, you're not gonna change someone's mind. You're not gonna make the person who says they're not racist and asking for a white doctor to suddenly, to suddenly see that they are in fact racist, right? The goal is to make them realize that what they're saying and what they're doing and their behavior is socially unacceptable. And importantly, stand up when you see injustice occurring. So I, I found this online and I really love it. I think that it's a great um, little pledge. Um, I am an upstander. I have the power to influence my peers. I say something or do something when you need help. I am there for you. I will help you get the help you need. You are not alone and I have your back. And that right there kind of goes through everything we just talked about. There is no one right way to intervene. Raising awareness and opening the door for conversation in the learning and work environment can be incredibly powerful. I hear a lot, well, I really don't wanna say the wrong thing. I really don't wanna offend the person I'm trying to help. I really, I just, the thought came to me too late. I thought about it a couple hours later. But remember that silence gives power to the oppressor. And that's really not an option. That's what we've done for centuries in this country. We've stood by silent as things have happened. And it's time to start speaking up and, and recognize that you may not do it perfectly. That's okay. This is a area where humans are fallible, right? And so I've kind of gone through this bit of introduction and conversation. Um, sorry, I'm gonna move this a little bit. Um, I don't like standing behind the podium. It gives me, I don't know. Um, how do our biases affect clinical decision-making? And this is where I really want to try and have more of a conversational kind of experience. I've talked a little bit about the biases that I experience. Um, I, I think that most of the time, people don't mean the things that they say in the way that they say them. And I've sort of come to terms with that, but I've also recognized that without actually saying something and without actually standing up, you sort of give them a, a pass to continue that behavior. And when it's the kind of death by a thousand small cuts, it may not bother me as much, but what about if it's a learner who, get, who hears those comments? What about if it's a, a student 
um, who's observing, who's thinking about going into the healthcare field. Um, I have a lot more power. I have a lot more power dynamic. I know that we, there have been surveys done and 60% of medical students and residents report experiencing microaggressions and discriminatory behavior. I don't know the data for other healthcare fields. I would suspect that nursing probably experiences even more because the nurses are at the bedsides of patients much, much longer during the day. How does that affect us in the way that we care for patients? But it's also, you know, think about the current climate of distrust of physicians. I'm not gonna call anybody out because I, this is a hard thing to talk about, but I do wanna kind of open it up. We're gonna talk about a, a couple of different things in the next um, 20 minutes or so. Um, but mostly I just want to hear any kind of conversational ideas. Have you had a situation that you would like to talk through? I don't know if there's anything on the... Um... It's also a pretty small room. You can probably talk out loud enough to... Oh, for people online, I can also repeat questions. So feel free to speak up, feel free to raise your hand, okay? I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, so I think that one of the things that we, in kind of coming up with this conversation, there's clinical scenarios where it's the provider um, being biased against the patient, and then there's the patient being biased against the provider. And I struggle because they're two parts of the same coin. Um, they're all based in these biases that we have learned. We know that with Dr. Moore's care, bias was definitely found in the um, assessment by the outside group that bias played a role in her care and potentially and likely her death. Um, and so I am going to talk a little bit about that, but I also want to make sure that everyone is aware that providers are experiencing this as well. Physicians, microaggress nurses, nurses, microaggress students or physicians, social workers, chaplains, support staff. I think that that's a really um, important thing because if we don't act as a team and we're kind of nitpicking at each other, it breaks us down. And this epidemic of healthcare workers feeling alone, stressed, tired, overworked is not helped by that and by that fact. And so I kind of wanted to have an opportunity if anyone wanted to talk about that part as well. Peyton. Oh, we use the microphone so they can hear. Um. Uh, so I'm Peyton Miller. I'm an intern on uh, for categorical general surgery. And I'm here with my co-intern, Lauren, um, who's with plastics. And we just had a situation up on the floor about an hour ago um, where a male patient was getting rather fussy with us about placing an NG tube. Um, and it was a little bit demoralizing. He didn't really, there wasn't any point where he like asked us if we were doctors or referred to us as somebody else, but certainly didn't give us the respect that we felt we deserved as his young it? doctors. What did he call us? He called, I it was something the equivalent of, um, what are you just the peanut gallery here to, to do this? And we're like, well, we're actually the doctors that are going to be placing this NG tube for you. So 
Yeah. And and he was like uh, snapping at Lauren and um, removing his own tape and like telling her, instructing her on how to how to remove the tape. And especially as a young resident who's pretty new to this, we're both still just getting our confidence. So when we walk into a situation like that, where we're we're trying to build our confidence and our confidence and present confidence so we can do the task at hand it's it's just even more demoralizing when the uh, patient obviously doesn't have confidence in you yeah that's really hard that's really stressful and it probably impacts how confident you were in doing the procedure right um and these are, these are really hard things. It's hard to be an upstander in that room if there's no one else in there with the two of you, right? Yeah, and that's what, when we walked out of the room, I told Lauren, like, I so wish I had said something to him, like, hey, you know, Do- Dr. Lottenslager went to school for eight years to put this NG tube in your nose, so. <laughs> and she paid quite a bit of money for it, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's hard to it's difficult to know what to say at that point. Cause you don't want to provoke the patient more, but, mm-hmm. but it is frustrating when we work 80 hour weeks and you get fussed at for, um, for putting an NG tube down on mm-hmm. patient's nose. I think I, I actually walked in the elevator after we, we did all this stuff. And I said, it's, I always try to gauge the balance of with a patient of um, how much they're fussing at you, how much you can fuss back. Because I feel like in certain patients, there's a degree of their fussing to fuss because that somehow is like a cathartic release of their own situation. And then equally when you, you know, fuss back at them, it makes them have some kind of intelligence of recognizing like you're just there to help them and, you know, don't take it out on me type situation, but others like how much change you're going to affect. Yeah. Like how much, how much can you say to them that to make them realize, you know, like kind of check their own behavior. Um, but then equally in the balance of all of that, this patient's been hospitalized. I don't know how many times since the beginning of the year, um, for this chronic medical problem that is, you know, something that he doesn't enjoy. Um, so I think how much do you tolerate in the brunt of what they're taking out on you unintentionally with the empathy of what they're going through in their own situation? Right. I mean, I think that the really big thing is to actually interject i mean you say the word fussing but he's being he's being my aggressive right these microaggressions are aggressive acts and you can interject and say you know i think that it's like i said it's hard to be an upstander when you're when you're in there alone but you know you could you can say something like you know, I think that your behavior is unacceptable right now. Let's focus on bringing care back to you. And the thing you need is this NG tube, right? You don't, you're not going to change his mind that he thinks you guys are the peanut gallery and young whippersnappers, but like, you're not behaving appropriately. We don't tolerate that. Okay. And it's hard when you're building your confidence. Um, and I can, I can send it. You guys probably should have gotten it when we did the upstander intervention for the residents, but we actually developed a card through the FAPDD that has comments that you can make kind of quick things. And the big thing is to practice. You are not going to know this stuff on a whim. It's not just knowing it. You kind of have to practice it and, and like look in the mirror when you're brushing your teeth and be like, I'm an experienced physician. This is what you need let's make sure that we turn the focus back to providing the best care for you, right? I'm an experienced nurse. This is what you need. The physicians and I have talked or my charge nurse and I have talked, we need to bring the focus back to you and and rely on the fact that you are the expert in that room in all likelihood. Um, But yeah, I think that especially younger people, when you don't have the confidence and you're not sure, and you don't want to speak back to people and you don't want to anger the, the patient. And you know, that patient satisfaction is the big thing that we harp on. Yes. You don't want to insult the patient. You don't want to turn it around into micro insult to micro insult. Right. But you want to make sure that 
you're kind of holding up what is acceptable behavior and what is it that we tolerate. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things online that have come in from our webinar folks. So the first one, I had an MD tell me once that respiratory therapists should be barefoot, pregnant, and not ask questions. So. I'm uh, sorry. I don't think that about respiratory therapists. No. I will also say that there is a difference between a microaggression and overt discrimination, which I would say that is. There's a few things in here. I'll maybe do one or two more and then. Sure. Okay. Um, so. You can set clear expectations regarding the patient's interactions to ensure focus of focus on the patient's medical needs while also being empathetic and recognizing patients' past experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and then another That's one. an excellent comment. Thank you. Um, another one. I was witness to an event with several providers who were making light of a patient's gender, referring to the patient as it. The patient did not openly identify as a gender different than assigned at birth, but the mother was very quick to correct in a curt manner when a team member used her instead of him. Being new and one of 10, I did not have the courage to speak up and I kept playing it back in my mind, especially since in retrospect, I believe the patient may not have come from a safe environment to openly identify as other than their assigned gender at birth. That patient may not have gotten the care they deserved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that unfortunately we can all kind of look back at times where we didn't speak up, we didn't feel prepared, we were scared, there was a power differential, um, you didn't come up with a, an answer until two hours later. My hope is that these kinds of talks and these kinds of trainings and hopefully you know, some people will go home and practice or say things in the car Practice with your co-residents or your co-workers. Um, and my hope is that that will start to build a cadre of people who can say, I did the thing that I needed to do in that time. And recognize that your co-workers can't say inappropriate things just like the patients can't say inappropriate things. There's two more comments on here. Okay. Um, so not a, a non-black coworker stated to the team, culturally, black women do not want C-sections, which is why the patient was against the doctor suggesting it. I was the only non-white staff in a circle of four team members. I should have shared my concern about her statement not being factual and offensive, but I didn't. I could not find the appropriate words to respond to her confidence about how black women feel about C-sections. I wish I would have at that time. The next day, I was still thinking about it. Yeah. We make a lot of assumptions about people for, based on their culture, based on where we think they're from. We treat patients who are underrepresented minorities as a monolith and they're not, you know, there may be black people who believe that, there may be white people who believe that. They're, they're, everybody is entitled to their beliefs based on their experiences. And making comments like that is why we have situations where Black men are less likely to receive limb salvage treatment. Black men are less likely to receive a, a catheterization when experiencing a STEMI. Black women have astronomical rates of morbidity and mortality in, sorry, perinatal morbidity and mortality. Um, and we can't pretend like those comments don't feed into some of that. Um, recognition of another person's fears that they may be behind their behavior, that may be behind their behavior, is important to also address in trying to resolve these situations. I am a telephonic nurse and often get a better result when I determine this from the person first. Yeah, I think that's really good. You're the patient that was, has been in the hospital a bunch of times, you know, beginning an NG tube can be traumatic. Maybe they had a bunch of different uh, bad experiences. What is it that what is that that you fear the most? Can be very powerful in helping a patient, listening to the patient. So um, the next slide, um, I'm going to give you a scenario, and I and I really don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I want you to just kind of be honest with yourself. Sit in the discomfort that you may experience. 
and I open it up to, to comments if you want. So I'm a trauma surgeon, I'm on call, and I get a page that says 32-year-old gunshot wound here now. Imagine the patient. I'm going to guess that the majority of you imagined a young black man. What do we think the patient was doing? I imagine many people think that there was some up to no goodness, right? Imagine what that patient's family is going through. Do you think they're really panicking at the fact that their loved one has been shot and maybe at a hospital they don't know where they are? Or do you think that they're out for revenge and likely to come and try and hurt the person? I think that the stories we tell in our head really points to the amount of bias that we bring into a clinical situation. Three words, okay, five words, because here now. But many of us, even those of us who may not be clinical, have created a story about this person without any other information. That quick emotional response, can you imagine if you go into that room and how that clouds potentially your judgment? Maybe instead, it's a um, veteran who shot themselves. Maybe it's someone whose gun went off in the car because we're allowed to carry guns here, but anyway. Maybe it's someone who was shot by their sibling, wife, cousin. Does it really matter? Does the story matter? A little bit in the clinical decision-making as far as like where they were shot, like on the body, but the, the, the rumor and the comment and the gossip, all of that really doesn't matter. Whether they were up to walking down the street and incidentally hit, maybe they were mistargeted, maybe they weren't shot intentionally, maybe they shot themselves, all of these things are things that the hospital and a lot of people in the hospital put a lot of focus on, including physicians. So how do we change our behavior so that this person gets the best care possible based on their injuries? hard. It's uncomfortable. Right? What about if you get a call? This patient's a VIP. We really, we've got to make sure this person is really important. We've got to make sure that they get special care. We're gonna do extra tests because they're a VIP. We don't wanna miss anything because they're a VIP. What does that mean? What happens then? There's actually pretty good evidence that when we change our practice from our normal behavior, we commit more errors. So then what happens to the VIP? And why isn't every patient a VIP? I feel like my mom should be a VIP. Peyton's mom should be a VIP, right? I would hate to think that we are changing the practice for a celebrity or a football player 
because they make a lot of money. But we do, right? Oh, let me make a call. I'll get you to the front of the CT scan line. Oh, let's make sure that the social worker can help them get the placement to their place of choice as quickly as possible. I see there's a couple of comments, Annie. I don't know. People, feel free to speak up. This is just me rambling. Well, they can't speak up online because. Oh, no, that's back. why I was saying I, I see there's. I see <laughs> oh, okay. that. Okay. I'm saying. So, no, you're fine. Um, so, right before you switched over to the VIP when you were talking mm -hmm. about, you know, for, um, we had a comment of, you know, put yourself in their shoes. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, and then uh, so we have another comment that says the news headlines do not help with bias or preconditioning. No, they don't. Um, and then, uh, so going back to talking about stories, uh, recent experience regarding a frontline team member expressing overt discrimination towards a patient while in the patient's room and in the presence of the patient's caregiver. Mm -hmm. The interaction was addressed by nearby staff, but interested in discussion of appropriate next steps addressing the situation with the patient, the caregiver, and the team member? Oh, that's an excellent question. So I think um, if the aggressor is a team member, right, the oppressed is the patient, you still want to be an upstander for that patient. And so again, thinking about refocus, assess, interject, refocus, is come back to that patient and the same things. I am so sorry you experienced that. That's not our culture. How can we do better for you, right? But then it also does need to be followed up with the team member and what the departmental or divisional or hospital-wide policies are on kind of retraining and reporting. I will confess, I don't fully know those. Um, but I think that there should at least be some kind of monitoring of the situation and probably educational activities into why that's inappropriate behavior. Um, going back to the list of replies that you had referred to earlier, is there a way to access those list of replies? I will try and get them from FAPDD. Yes, I believe so, but I'll check with Dr. Tori. Okay. I, um, we give it out when we do the upstander intervention training class. So we'll talk about that again, but um, to go through that upstander intervention training course, it's a 90 minute course. It's fantastic. Um, it's offered um, throughout the system. Uh, and yes, you get it then. I'll double check with Dr. Tori if we can send it out. Okay. And then the most, the most recent comment then was sometimes it can be the providers, their children, family members perpetuating the idea of VIPs. Oh, absolutely. I am totally guilty of that, 100%. I use my influence to make sure that my family members get the best care possible. And I watch doctors like a hawk. Um, I try very hard not to do things like have them alter the way that their care is usually done, but, and it's not fair. It is privilege. I don't have an answer. I'm acknowledging my bias. I'm sorry, I need to be better. But when my husband is sick, I, it's actually kind of hard. Like if I walk into the emergency room with my husband, right? The people in the ER know me. So it may not be using my bias, but yes, it is. What about when a patient asks for more pain medicine? What about when they're complaining of pain? What about when the presentation, okay, so this is something that I will frequently hear from my residents. <clears throat> this is a 45 year old white female with a history of heroin abuse and also takes Suboxone and Methadone. And uh, she was here because she fell off the ladder and broke her leg. What is that? That tells you a story, right? You're telling me more about the patient's use disorders than the trauma and the thing that is causing them pain. We do this a lot. We do it in all fields, right? 
what we lead with in that thinking about the, the um, headline that the, the news people do, we do the same thing in medicine, right? Age, gender, race, past medical things and all kinds of story that you've been told. Diagnosis, right? And, and that is making a story. That's framing things. Yes, we need to know that information because we need to be able to care for the patient properly. But the way that you do with the headline makes a huge difference because the first thing people are gonna think about is opiate use disorder, not broken leg. Another interesting comment that just popped up as well. I've observed people change the way they talk about a patient or family after they have seen the patient's address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know how many of you know about this, but you can actually in Cerner, the patient's address is linked to Google Maps and you can actually look at their house. Um, it's really not good. You also see the patient's insurance, right? Um, there's also this weird like bubble thing that shows all of the diagnoses that are mentioned in the thing and, and how frequently. L once again, I think that it is, yes, uh, some of that information is important. You need to know where a patient lives in order to help them get care in their community. How far away do you live? Okay, you're not going to drive three hours for daily dressing changes or whatever. But do you live in Carmel versus uh, over by rural? I don't remember. I don't know the names of places yet, guys. I'm sorry. I've only been here four years. Lawrence. Lawrence. See, I only know Lawrence for Fort Harrison. So, but yeah, I mean, I think that when you, when you start looking at that and looking about where people live and what they do and who they are and who they know, it does start to make a big difference in how you talk to the patient, how you treat the patient. And that's where you're, you can take a pause and say, am I changing my behavior because of my assumptions about this patient? I try to treat every patient, no matter why they're in the hospital, as if they were a family member. It is hard sometimes, because sometimes they're yelling at me and cursing me and generally being a pain, but you know what? So do some of my family members. I still want them to get good care, right? Um, I, I, my talk is really an amalgam of reading and Google searching and talking to people and experiences. I think that this is really powerful. This is by Dr. Ola Uwola, who is at Ohio State. She's now the chief medical officer for a big health insurance company that I'm totally blanking on right now. But as a patient, the caseworker entered my room, I introduced myself and he refused to shake my hand. No way, he said. He turned to his caseworker. You didn't tell me I was going to see a black doctor. And not just a black doctor, but a black woman. She looked at me in disbelief. I'm sorry. There's no way I'm letting a black woman take care of me. Black women are the problem with this whole country and world. No way. What happened to the real doctors, the white doctors? Black people are taking over everything. Everywhere I look, there are N-words. I was too sad to cry too hurt to feel, too paralyzed to move, and too embarrassed to come out of the room. I sat and pondered over what had happened. Racism had just completely and tectonically shifted the power away from me. Racism stripped me of my white coat, my stethoscope, my doctor's badge, my degrees and credentials, my titles, skills, determination to serve. Racism showed up in that moment as the perfect antidote to my superpower. 
And this is happening daily. And you could, you can put sexism in the term. I mean, I would say that, you know, kind of Peyton, we've had a number of the online comments, right? And yes, these are not microaggressions. This is overt discrimination, but there is such, think about it in that iceberg, there is a very narrow meniscus of difference between a microaggression or a micro insult and an overt insult. So Dr. Meager, one of the comments that came in, imagining how a situation might look from someone else's perspective can be hard when we are stressed or triggered, but it seems critical to recognizing our own biases or dealing with someone else's biases and responding to aggression. Any suggestions on how about processing this in the moment? So sometimes you can't. Sometimes if, particularly if it's a very charged situation or if there's a lot of emotions involved, what you can do as an upstander is extract the team from the situation and say, I need a second here. Refocus on the person who's experiencing it. Think about what you're gonna say and then go back to the aggressor and say, this was not appropriate behavior based on XYZ, blah, blah, blah. We don't accept that here. Um, it is hard when you're in a situation where it becomes very charged very quickly. Um, and I don't have a great specific answer other than sometimes the right thing to do is to extract yourself and then return to it with a clearer kind of calmer head. I found this amazing um, article who um, Dr. Catherine Brooks wrote actually when she was a medical student and it's called a silent curriculum. And it's an amazing um, reflection on just how much of our biases are taught to us in the medical field from the beginning. I learned to insert my patient's race in the opening of my oral presentations as though it had as much impact on the medical details to follow as their sex or age. I learned to blame miscommunications and poor ad adherence on the patient rather than any language barrier. I learned it was acceptable to deliver the diagnosis to, of terminal cancer in broken Spanish and to use a 13 year old girl to translate the details of her intubated father's care. I was told I wouldn't learn anything new by continuing to follow a black woman fighting drug addiction and struggling to adhere to her medications since I wouldn't be able to change her behavior. These lessons came from physicians, nurses, classmates, many of whom I admire and call my mentors. Some lessons came when I made my own discriminatory statements and no one challenged them. I know we're starting to get low on time. Mm -hmm. The comments that are in the Q and A right now do have names attached to them, so I can send those to you for responses later. Um, do you want? We've got a little time. I think okay. the I think I'm actually right at the last slide. So, okay. Um, so, are there resources? And I think you're gonna you're about to get to the resources. So, are there resources for? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm magic. <laughs> um, who have not received this type of education. So somebody who grew up isolated or people who aren't even aware that a phrase they say is bias. So what kind of resources do you have? I think it's amazing that you recognize that you grew up isolated. Um, I will say that the number one thing you can do is start to expose yourself to different cultures, situations, friendship groups. Um, I have found a lot of, I have gained a lot of knowledge and understanding just from reading. Um, even novels. I read, I, I've been telling everyone this last year, I took a vacation and the, the best novel I've read in the last couple of years is a, is a novel called Americana. And I am blanking on the author's name right now. She is Nigerian woman. She's fantastic. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it is an amazing look at how someone it's, it's a story of a woman who comes to the U S for college. And it is an amazing look at how 
America treats immigrants and the immigrant experience from the other side. And I think it did a lot to open my eyes to how much of our foreign medical graduates go through, how much um, people struggle, even if they have education and knowledge and money, all of those things can really affect things. So um, reading, reaching out to people, we do have diversity programming through FAPDD. Um, these are the, the programs that I'm involved in teaching. There actually is a link on there where you can contact to schedule a session through your division, department, however um, you are aligned in the organization. Um, if you're having any issues, I'm happy to come and do the implicit bias training and the upstander intervention training. I think the inclusivity in medicine right now is only available for medical students, but I'm not sure when we're gonna roll that out. That's a, a much more involved program. And then these are really important um, resources. So the employee assistance program, if you're having difficulty, you're experiencing burnout, any of this stuff you're struggling with, please reach out. Um, there's also the mental health crisis line, the mistreatment incident report for IUSM. There's also an incident reporting system for IU Health um, through Cerner and other ways. IUSM has an ombuds office where you can report about, report things, the Office of Equal Opportunity at IUPUI. IU Health has an alert line where you can call and report um, incidents and uh, there's, it's call or go online. Eskenazi also has incident reporting. And then IUHP, Terry Christopher is the HR manager and has expressed um, willingness to, to be involved and help in any way if there's issues that would like to need to be reported or questions. And I did just put in the chat real quick for those online. This slide is available on our website as a PDF um, under the events tab um, with the lecture series. I wanna thank you all. Um, this is a poem that was written by Dr. Alvaro Torrey. Um, his, one of his graduate students. And I feel like it is kind of everything that I just went through in an hour. Um, and I just want you to listen to her read it. Maybe. What's sad, but true. My licensure for service can in an instant be revoked. What did I do? I've gone to school like you, stayed up late nights like you, done rounds like you, and still am undervalued. I put on my uniform for service with you, the rest, my badge, my white coat, pass the test, earn the stripes that say I can save lives, and yet my access can be denied. My qualifications for service can be pushed aside. Simply put, someone's limited opinion of me can trade out facts for knowing best, making my qualified mean less and less. My time spent to operate under the Hippocratic Oath is rendered insufficient in an instant. My bedside manner, though mastered, is no longer relevant. The time-intensive, costly process for me in an instant can be reduced to worthless. And others' assumption about me, not my qualifications, but my person, determines if all my work was worth it. To know that a lacking first impression makes the decision, ultimately gives me permission, not my ability, something innate about me, can judge me unfit, unworthy, when I'm like you, qualified to do my duty. The irony that a less than qualified other's opinion can try to take my qualified from me. My person is the final test and it's summed up in what they hear and see. This is the invisible test of my identity, where what the eyes see and ears hear can stop me, block me from my professional identity. Nevertheless, 
this uphill journey I will pursue with all the cuts and scars that have gone with me till now and may lie ahead, I will relentlessly continue. But today, I am asking you to do what you are qualified to do. Speak up, speak truth, and know this, in more ways than not, I am like you. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate you being here today.